Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar on sustain sustainable and responsible investing. My name is Bakia Shulman. I'm a partner at St. James's Place Wealth Management, and I'm delighted to welcome our guest, Jessica Robinson. My goal is to deliver financial well being in a world worth living in. I strongly believe that investing for your financial future and investing for a better future can coexist. Money can be used as a force for good. So let me introduce Jessica. Jessica is the founder of Moxie Future, the world's first education insight and community platform empowering women as sustainable investors and as financial feminists. Jessica also has a day job, working as, as a strategic advisor to institutional investors, think tanks, and governments on all things green finance, sustainability, responsible investing, and gender. Jessica has lived and worked in the UK, North America, China, Hong Kong, and is now based in the UAE. Jessica has also recently launched a book, Financial Feminism, A Woman's Guide to Investing for Sustainable Future, which we'll be talking a lot about. So just a little bit of housekeeping. Um, everyone, you're all muted. Uh, we will be leaving opportunity for questions at the end. So on your side panel, um, you will pop any questions you have into the question box and we will answer them at the end. Okay, so enough from me, Jessica, welcome. Hi, uh, thank let's, you. Let's start off, let's start off the basics. What exactly is sustainable investing? Can you explain what it is and, and how did it come about? Sure, okay. Thank you, Bastian. Thank you for inviting me. Um, you know, this is my favorite topic for discussion. So, all right, just let's cover enough, as you said, the basics. Um, there's obviously a difference between uh, it, between saving and investing. And, uh, you know, and historically, investing has always been around and been concerned with financial returns. But what we've seen in the last, say, sort of decade, um, that this is actually really changing. And, and this is where the concept of sustainable investing has come in. So you may well have heard of things like sustainable and responsible investing, impact investing, ESG investing, all of these terms, while there are very nuanced differences between them, I like to think there is a commonality. And quite simply, that's the goal to achieve some kind of positive change in an area that the investor is really passionate about. Um, and obviously, invariably, that has a social and or an environmental dimension. So to give it a very sort of textbook definition, we talk about sustainable, responsible and impact investing as being an investment discipline which considers environmental, social and corporate governance criteria to generate long term competitive financial returns and positive societal impact. So when you look at things like the environment, so under the E, we think about, so what impact does a company have on the resources that sustain it? Um, and that can be pretty broad. You could think around things like its contribution to climate change, uh, greenhouse gas emissions, potential climate solutions, things around energy efficiency, biodiversity, and so forth. On the S, the social factors, These this really relates to how a, com a company operates in society. So the labor standard it has, how it treats its suppliers, its local communities, also touches on hot topics like child labor, um, but also the mundane stuff such as health and safety, um, management like that. And then the G, which is around the governance, the, the rules and the principles that determine the relationship between the management of that company and its various stakeholders. So whether that's investors, local communities and so forth. And again, it touches on things such as internal controls, directors pay, and another hot topic, diversity, which I'm sure we will talk about a bit later. So, so you, in that sort of universe of issues, you're actually talking about looking at these ESG criteria from an investor perspective. Um, what I do want to stress, and I think this is a bit of a misnomer sometimes in the market, we're not talking about charity and we're not talking about philanthropy. We are talking about investments. So we are touching on financial returns, but also looking at the non-financial return aspect. 
Um, and I think this takes uh, takes us to a sort of more philosophical discussion, which I won't bore people with today, but it's worth thinking about in terms of, you know, what is the real purpose of capital? What's the purpose of our wealth? And when we look to invest, what kind of financial wealth, where are we looking to invest it in certain projects and businesses? Um, and to me, and this is where I won't, I won't sort of drone on with this value talk, but I believe that we invest to bring benefits to all participants. And, and to me, that sits across people, um, across societies and across generations. And, and the generational piece is really important when we talk about climate change and investing in climate. Um, and, I, and I think so sort of to the crux of sustainable investing is, um, you know, money is a construct. It's a social con construct. We came up with it as a way to organize our economy, our societies, but it, in itself, it's not an end. Um, it's actually always been a means to create the world that we want to live in. And that's ultimately what we're talking about, right? Using the money we, we, we have to create the kind of world we want to live in. Fantastic. You touched on so many points there. Um, so I won't bore you with all the about... philosophy stuff. <laughs> <laughs> um, you spoke about financial return and non-financial return. So let's talk about it. Responsible investing. This can give good financial returns. So maybe you can talk about how the trend in the past year and how ESG funds have been performing uh, and specifically how the pandem pandemic has impact sustainable investing. Yeah, I, I think this is, this is really fascinating because when the pandemic hit, you know, when we all started to realize what was happening sort of Q1 last year, for people like me who sort of dedicated the last 15, 20 years of their career to sustainable finance, responsible investment, honestly, I really felt at the time I was worried. I thought, okay, this is going to be like the death knell for us as all in the industry because everyone's now going to revert back and start thinking about short term gain, short term control. How do we manage economies in the short term? And actually what that would mean for responsible investing, which is all about thinking about the long term, it, you know, I was seriously worried. Um, but what actually happened was that was not the case. Uh, we've actually seen demand, investor demand continue across institutional investors, retail investors alike. We're seeing supply continue. So more and more investment products are coming onto the market. And actually on the performance side, the data is now telling us that ESG leaders, whether they be the companies or the funds, have actually done very well. So when you look at the companies that have, that have straight sustainability strategies in place, that manage their ESG risks well, these have actually proven to be a lot more resilient during, you know, during 2020 and beyond. And, and you know, that really tells us something. It tells us that these are companies that are, are well managed. They're aware of their risks beyond their financial risks. And these are the kind of companies and the funds you want to invest in. Uh, the other impact I would say about the pandemic, which again, I think is fascinating, is that um, we became a lot more aware of social risks. So even from the investor perspective, we started to reflect on the S piece of the ESG. And up until 2020, that was probably kind of the one that was trailing a little bit. But COVID taught us how interconnected we are as a world. But at the same time, these huge glaring inequalities that we face. Uh, and so what we've seen, investors increasingly start to talk about social, social risks. We also saw a rise in issuance of social bonds last year. Um, so all of that actually has been quite positive. And now here we sit in 2021. Um, and having a year ago been quite worried and concerned, I'm actually incredibly optimistic. Um, so I think there's a lot to look forward to. The other thing, just to talk about 2020, because I know it was difficult for us all, but the other thing that came out of 2020 was obviously things around diversity and the Black Lives Matter movement, right? Um, and again, taking that back to the investor perspective, you know, we'd all been talking about diversity for so, you know, for a number of years, gender diversity, all sorts of diversity. But what we learned last year was that we haven't actually done as well as we intended to. So I actually think another positive to come out of last year is, listen, for all of the talk around diversity, we're not actually delivering. So I, I think that's, again, a big learning from last year. Okay, great. Excellent. Thank you. You spoke earlier, uh, mentioned about climate change. 
and climate change is tipped to be the biggest trend for 2021. And Biden himself famously promised to address a climate in crisis. So can you talk a little bit more about climate change and how, how does this impact sustainable investing? Yeah, okay, so climate is my, uh, aside from gender, uh, climate is my sort of, my big, uh, my big passion. So I can go on for a long time, but I won't. So I would say that it's wonderful that Biden and the US are back at the table. I really hand on my heart, it's, it's, it's wonderful. But I would say climate change on the investor agenda has been sort of very topical for at least the last couple of years. And a lot of that has happened through the Paris Climate Agreement, which essentially gave us a, climate, a carbon budget with it, within which to operate, to build businesses, set net, net zero targets and strategies and so forth. And of course, again, the Sustainable Development Goals, where climate sits right at the middle. Um, so, I mean, I, I, while it is incredibly important in 2021, there's a lot of work that's happened in the last couple of years to get us to that point from the, in the investor perspective. And I think what's important about climate is it's not climate change as a standalone climate affects so many other esg issues you know like migration climate migration is is a massive risk food security gender equality because we know that actually women tend to suffer more from the negative impacts on climate change whether it be economic or social um so from a risk perspective, which is as an investor, you're thinking about the risks that you want to manage in your portfolio. Climate, whilst it is, you can think of it as climate risk, it sits across so many of those other, other issues as well. And I think when you're looking as an investor um, and you're looking as a sustainable investor, you want to think about the key issues that matter to you because while well, there is obviously a moral imperative to do good, there's also about good risk management and creating long-term business values. So if you're looking to invest in a, in a company, you, d you wouldn't want to invest in a company that pollutes the environment or uses child labor or, or whatever. You're actually thinking, I want companies that are aligned with my values, but I also want a company that focuses on the long-term, thinks about how its actions impact on the environment, reduces impact and so forth. So, you know, I, I always come back in in this discussion but also the discussions i have in my day job when i work with institutional investors and the like you always come back to the risk piece so what would you look for um i think it's important to bear in mind that climate change translates into everything in the financial world uh there's no market there's no financial institution there's no investor that's going to be immune so even you as an individual, as you start out on your retail investment journey or you're managing your pension investment or whatever, always, always consider climate. So any company that you're invested in, you want to know that it has a, a, a sort of climate strategy in place. So you can look at simple things like company reports, right? Has climate risk been built into its strategic planning process? Are there climate resilient plans? If not, you need to be concerned. Um, and it's it's interesting. Obviously, it impacts on companies in sectors like energy, natural resources, infrastructure, of course, the obvious ones. There are so many other industries, consumer, fashion, everything is affected by climate. Um, and you just basically want to manage your exposure to these companies. On the, on the flip side, it's not all downside risk, right? Uh, to deal with climate change, we need to radically transform the way we work the way we consume, the way we live, how we generate energy. Um, so it's also about looking for exciting companies, those that are deploying their strategies and capital to really take advantage of those investment opportunities. Um, just take the motor industry. I mean, everyone loves Tesla and uh, I like, but you know, there's a lot of that coming on online. Um, and then technology, looking at, at opportunities that will emerge as a result of climate resilience technology. So quite technical things like remote sensors in agriculture to renewable storage solutions, which we know is a big issue, smart grids, uh, drones that they use in conservation. I mean, there's so many cool stuff. And I say that because I'm not a technical person at all, but <laughs> there's a lot of really cool climate tech. And you get, you, I don't know if anyone's noticed, but you're getting all these like celebrities coming. Uh, what was I reading today? Robert Downey Jr. has launched a climate tech fund. And uh, <laughs> OK, 
Okay. So <laughs> it's increasingly becoming easier to do it, right? You can read about it and all sorts of things. Um, and I think one, you know, one of the, and we'll come on to my book in a bit, but one of the reasons I wrote the book was I felt that nobody talks to retail investors about things like this, particularly women, but we'll we'll talk about that later. But um, what's really cool now is that that actually we're waking up to the fact that retail investors want to do do more with their money. So um, yeah, so so I think you know on the climate side, I, I as much as I can talk about it, and you can always reach out to me with any questions. I, I do think you know it's not all about risk. There are some exciting things going on as well. So should we all become vegan all of a sudden? <laughs> <laughs> well, I have to be, I've been toying with being a vegan for about seven years, but um, in lockdown, my my three children decided to challenge me to learn how to barbecue. So my veganism sort of came to a rapid end when they discovered I could barbecue ribs. So. <laughs> <laughs> but you're playing a small part in other ways. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> Okay, um, you spoke a little bit about reporting and looking at company reports. Now, there's no real global standards at the moment for, for ESG funds. So, so for people who are starting off investing or for investors as well, what, what should they look for to obtain accurate and reliable data about ESG funds? Yeah, I mean, I sigh. Um, this is a very difficult area, um, understandably so, because you're talking about so many different dynamics, data points, KPIs, uh, different measurement techniques and so forth. Um, that said, there's been a lot of progress has been made and we've got regulators all around the world bringing in standardization. So as well, as much as it's challenging, we were in a great place in 2021 compared to where we were a couple of years ago. And I, I'd say also particularly in, um, obviously the European Union is doing a lot of work on taxonomies um, and definitions. So uh, I, I really think that is changing. In the meantime, uh, my suggestion to, to individual investors uh, with limited access obviously to certain uh, data sets and the like is is try to use as many different sources as you can uh, because I think being broad and I do talk about this a lot in the book as well about how to become more educated because it, it's not an exact science so making sure that you use these different different sources and whether that's like reports that come out from NGOs and there are some phenomenal NGOs out there so if you look at something like um, as you sow they've done a lot of work on fossil free fossil free funds um and so they're really good and then you've got the global reporting institute so you've got lots of different frameworks that are worth re referring to there is a move to bring them all together so hopefully in the next couple of years we'll see a lot more of this this come together um i'd also say and obviously being hosted by by uh, you guys as wealth managers get the right kind of advice make sure you're talking to somebody who understands what ESG is and then can direct you in terms of looking for reliable data around ESG funds. Um, and the final thing, which is not really particularly constructive advice, it's more of a warning, and it's something that really concerns me is this issue around greenwashing. So um, as sustainable investing has become the trend and ESG is the buzzword, we're seeing a lot of greenwashing. So that does require you as the investor to make sure you do your homework. Um, and I sometimes cite this example that, you know, I'm in the industry and I was invested in uh, my Hong Kong pension fund and I, I, I just ticked the green box and then uh, the green fund box. And then about two years later, I decided to explore what was in the fund. And actually one of the, the biggest holdings was a major uh, investment bank. And the reason it was in the green fund was because it obviously as an investment bank doesn't have a huge environmental footprint beyond travel and paper use, but actually it's the, one of the biggest finances of coal in Asia. So it was completely misaligned with me, but I'd, I'd fallen for the greenwash label and I hadn't done my homework. So I, I say that as a warning, because I think we've just got to be careful about that. So they called it the green fund. <laughs> yes. <laughs> what, what about the United Nations? They have a principle of responsible investing. Can you yeah, so uh, 
Yeah, so the, so the UN, the PRI, uh, well, actually I was head of Asia for them for, for a while. So they are a big framework of, so it, it's, a, it's a guiding framework of principles, aspirational principles that asset managers, uh, asset owners, pension funds sign up to. And they've got a huge amount of traction uh, in the last, well, they've been around for 10 plus years, but the last couple of years are getting a lot of traction. So if you're going with an asset manager, or you want to see your pension fund, it's probably worth seeing if they're a signatory, because if they're a signatory of the PRI, you may be able to find more about their responsible investment policy, um, their reporting, et cetera. So it's fantastic that the PRI is getting so much traction because it's giving us a framework across the world uh, for asset managers, investment managers to really apply responsible investment criteria. So it's definitely worth taking a look. Also, you've got the launch of the responsible banking principles. So on your banking side, you may also at some point want to do that as well. Uh, uh, thank you. And it's, and it's important. It's not. It's about a whole framework. Um, yeah. It's about a vision. It's about a strategy. It's about ongoing monitoring. It's about understanding fund managers. So it's just. It's not just a one quick um, yeah. stop. It's a whole framework Absolutely. that we need to be aware of in yeah, to maintain these standards. Okay, so let's let's talk about your book. Okay. Um Jessica had written this book, A Woman's Guide to Investing for Sustainable Futures. Um this book honestly it's fantastic. Um I've had many laugh out loud moments. One of my favorite all-time quotes is, um, I love quoting Albert Einstein on compound interest. Um, Albert Einstein called compound interest the eighth wonder of the world. He who understands it earns it, and he who doesn't pays it. And Jessica, in her book, she said, I'm pretty sure that she who understands it also earns it. So fantastic. Uh, <laughs> she definitely understands it and she definitely earns it. Um, so let, let's start off. Um, before we dig into the book, financial feminism. What is financial feminism? So, I mean, so with everything feminism related, it, it's about equality, right? So it's about the financial equality of women. And um, and I think we all know women face huge financial gaps. Uh, obviously, the gender pay gap is the big one, and that's the one we talk about a lot. Uh, but one of the things I explore in the book is all the other gaps that women face. So you've got the pension gaps, saving gaps, debt gaps. You know, in some instances, women actually pay more for their debt than men. Um, and then you've got the funding gap. So we know female founders receive such a small percentage of VC funding. So all of these issues uh, really highlight this concept of financial feminism. You know, how do we grapple with these issues to ensure that we have greater equality from a financial perspective? Um, at the same time, so at the same time as this, this thing gaining momentum, we're also looking at women controlling more of the world's work, work, wealth. So we're now looking at around an estimated 30%. Um, I know that's still shocking, but actually it's a good improvement, right? So that's of ownership of global private wealth, and that's expected to grow annually. And obviously it's more increasingly self-generated. So women are these economic powerhouses, which I think we all know, but it's really good to see some stats around it, right? At the same time, the other trend that we observe is that women care about this, this bigger picture. Uh, and one of the things I did when I set up Moxie Future, which I should say is, is kind of like a, a sort of hobby, like a, like a sort of passion of mine, we undertook some global research to actually figure out, uh, is there something in it that women are thinking about impact with their money? And so we surveyed women in five different countries, so China, Australia, UK, Germany, and the US. And we did find pretty consistently across the board that around nine, 79 to 80% of women urgent feel that we urgently need to act in order to build a better world and 69 percent of women feel that their investment decisions reflect their personal values so this all comes back to the concept of financial feminism to believe that women have a right to financial equality and to advocate on that basis but for me and this is the crux of my book and i hope what everybody takes from this conversation is it's not just 
about women earning and investing on a par with men. It's actually about using your wealth and to the, the initial comments we had around what is the purpose of wealth. So to me, financial feminism is about using your wealth to create the world you want to live in. And sure, we need to invest more. Sure, we need to, to, to earn more on, and on a par with men. But actually, financial feminism represents the opportunity for women to use that financial power to build the kind of world that we want to live in. And to me, that's why sustainable investing is such a powerful lever of change, right? It, it's, it's actually sort of pushing back and saying, actually, hang on, wealth, capital, money, the way I invest is more than just making more money. It's actually saying, I have a voice in my wealth and this is what I wanted to deliver on. So that's, uh, that's the sort of the, the, the message of the book, which is let's just not stop at financial feminism being about equality. It's actually, I've got a really strong voice in my wealth and this is how I want to use it. Can I actually just, sorry, before I, say, before I move on, I just wanted to say the one quote that I love is the Gloria Steinem one. Um, we will never solve the feminization of power until we solve the masculinity of wealth. And I tell you what, if that's one I put on the wall for my teenage daughters. <laughs> Fabulous. So this book is also for men, not only for women. No. <laughs> yes. I mean, this is the thing. I mean, so obviously people, people ask me a lot of the time, like, why did you write it for women? not for men. And, and I'm not saying sustainable investing is for women only. No, not, not at all. This is not a man versus a woman discussion. Sustainable investing is for everybody. But what we know is that women feel disengaged with the financial industry. A lot of evidence out there says they feel, they feel patronized, they feel talked down to by their banks, by their advisors. You even look at like how women are marketed to, right? Um, and again, this is I do reference this in my book. There was some research done by Starling Bank, which is the UK bank, looking at the way that the, the messaging in media around finances and investment. And we talk to men as though it's about being brave and taking risks and earning more money and the wealth and the power that goes with that. But we talk to women as though they need to save and be careful and be cautious. Um, so, can you, you know, in the way we talk then to women and men about money and what it represents is, is hugely significant. So when I decided to write a book specifically for women, it was not to the exclusion of men. It was simply I just want to focus on what women need right now when they're talking about their money and their investment. It's just a conversation with women who I know probably feel very similar to me. And so far, the financial industry hasn't done a great job at engaging with them. So, oh, and by the way, I quite a lot of my male friends have read the book. <laughs> so, um, for those on the call, um, the book I've read it, um, it doesn't have any jargon. Um, wh when I read the book, I could actually hear Jessica's voice. So it's, it's like her reading it out. It, it's very, she writes like she talks. So it's a very, easy read, um, it's very enjoyable. Um, Jessica, what would you say the key takeaways from the book are? Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, I, as Patty said, I purposely wrote the book in a very informal style. Like, like we could be sitting in a room with a glass of wine chatting about it. That's, that's what I wanted to do. And um, because my aim, my, my aim is really just to empower women to take the next step. Uh, I want I want someone to read the book and, and to put it down and go, OK, I can start making change happen. I want to give them enough information. I, I, you know, I'm not a financial advisor. I'm not an investment professional. I'm a sustainable finance expert. But what I want to do is arm the reader with enough information to then go into the bank or to go to a financial advisor and say, with confidence, this is what I want to do with my money. You know, please help me figure this out. These impacts are important to me. So the, the sort of takeaway is don't be intimidated by an industry. Take the information in this book, speak with your friends, build your sisterhood, figure this out, and don't just follow what you're told to do. Because it's not just for, sustainable investing isn't just for millionaires, as much as like some of the banks market it as. It's not, it's, it's everybody can make a difference 
with those investment decisions. So the key takeaway is just be a feminist, <laughs> take this information and really make change happen. So in the book, you talk about eight steps that will start you on your road to sustainable investing. Can you maybe walk through, maybe you don't have time for eight, but what are the key steps that for people? Yeah, I'm not sure I'm going to all eight. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think I can remember all eight off the top of my head. Um, okay, so, so the, the big one, obviously, is you've got to figure out what you care about. The challenge with sustainable investing is you can't fix the whole world, right? So you have to figure out what are your priorities in terms of that ESG universe. I mentioned uh, climate change. Climate change is my big thing. The other thing is gender. I mean, female empowerment's a really big thing for me as well. So prioritize what you really care about and then really translate that into what you call your sustainable investment beliefs. And that's really like, okay, my personal philosophy is X, Y, Z. And then you need to set your goals and you need to say, okay, well then if this is a priority, what do I want my investments to accomplish? And the more specific you are, the easier it is to, to, to really identify how and where to invest. Uh, I also think it's worth setting your boundaries. I mentioned, you know, we can't fix the whole world. Um, <clears throat> but you may also say, actually, in the first couple of years, I just want to take 10% of my wealth to focus on this because I'm learning. Um, to what extent do I want external advice versus talking to friends? Uh, and then once you've done that, ultimately, you've got to get much more educated and more empowered. There's so much information out there now, and it's so accessible. Sign up to NGOs who are in the space that you, you want to focus on. Sign up to, you know, speak to financial advisors. There are lots of blog sites. Go to Moxie. We, we do articles and research all the time. Just even set aside, say, an hour a week just to get more educated. Uh, and then obviously just really start starting action planning and, and figuring out how you're going to allocate money. I also recommend, um, based on my experience with my pension fund, looking through your pension funds and just figuring out where you're invested. Uh, and if it's not very transparent, then call them up, send them an email. You know, the more we, we, the more we talk to pension providers, asset managers, and the more we say this matters, the more transparent they'll be and the more action they'll take. So, you know, it, it's on your on your head to just get out there and, and really ask those questions. I think, you know, ultimately being a sustainable investor is really just about making well informed and well considered decisions. Uh, it may mean that they take doesn't mean they have to take longer, but it's just about being thought out and building your confidence over time, right? It, it's not going to happen overnight. Uh, the other thing I also encourage women to do is to seek out investment clubs uh, or invest in networks. Uh, and if there aren't any, set them up. And these don't have to be like investment clubs as in we're going to pull money and invest. These can be almost like book clubs, right? You come together, you talk about issues, you talk about what might be out there and you share your information. Um, I give a good example. When I moved to Dubai from Asia a few years ago, uh, I found there was something called the Women's Angel Investor Network and I wanted to become a very active gender lens investor. And so I started going and actually a lot of my very good friends, I actually met there because you're dealing with like-minded women. And I, I know that there are more and more of these investor clubs focused on women uh, all around, all around the world. In fact, I think Singapore, there are a couple, right? Um, I, you know, I think, I think we're seeing more of them all crop up. And you know, there's nothing stopping someone setting their own investment club up. It can be a very informal, as I said, like a book club. And then you could read my book in the in the meeting. <laughs> I'm gonna tell you later where you can buy the book. <laughs> um, thank you. So, um. I'm going to maybe ask a little bit of a controversial topic, um, cryptocurrency, Bitcoin. So, and how the negative consequences um, from an ESG perspective. So the, the two main concerns with cryptocurrency, one is that it's heavily utilized in financing criminal activities in a non-regulated market. And the lax governance of coin exchanges can um, expose retail investors to significant losses. And the second concern mainly being about the energy consumption. And 
the energy consumption associated with computer heavy coin mining um, is actually, I read last week, that the electricity consumption of mining Bitcoin is greater than the whole energy consumption of Argentina. And this was even before the latest spike in prices in the past two weeks. So, so what, what are your thoughts on this? Okay, so I, a huge caveat. I'm talking as as an as an individual, not as an expert, because I I do not know much about Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies, and I am probably as cautious and as confused as as the next woman. Um, so what I say is for me as an individual, not as a sustainable finance expert, expert or anything. My my concern comes from. Uh, is this more of the same as in is this more of this testosterone driven gambling like mentality chasing financial returns without thinking long about long term impact I actually don't know the answer because it, to me I still am trying to get my head around it I don't know what the link to, to crypto is to, to real value um, and I think that sits again at the heart of sustainable investing is why do we invest money? Why do we invest wealth? Is it about creating value? And what does value look like? Well, to me, it looks like access to healthcare. It looks like strong education systems. It looks like clean air. It looks like, uh, you know, transport systems that are accessible for all and clean and, and you know, low impact, right? Um, where I struggle is I, I don't see that link to intrinsic value. The other thing, and, and actually the points you make around the environmental footprint, if you look at the data that's been coming out around who's been doing what in cryptos, it's mostly men. Women are not attracted at the moment to this, right? Now, there's a reason why. And, and I think that's something we need to explore more. And actually, I might write a blog post on that at some point. <laughs> You know, and, and uh, it's actually quite funny when I think about my friends, my groups of friends and the number of like the younger male friends I have, like maybe at my brother's younger, right? You know, they're all about crypto and Bitcoin and whatever, but it's chasing that the same thing that people did in the dot com bubble. You know, it's it's the same sort of need for more financial return. So it worries me. <laughs> it's a gamble. And yeah. I think returns can be as high and you can lose just as much very, very mm. quickly. And I um, you know something the other day, uh, I, 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 I'm embarrassed I only just watched it now. You know, the, the big short, the movie about that 2008. Um, yeah. And I, I, I just only had time to watch it recently. And again, I mean, it's a brilliant film, but again, it's all men, right? It's all men, apart from... Margot Robbie in the bath with her glass of champagne. I mean, what does that say to you, right? The sexualization. But, and, and as I was watching it, I was reflecting on what's happening now in crypto. And it, again, I think we need to have those questions, right? Thank you. Okay, so we've spoken about, you know, retail investors and what we need to be doing. Um, companies need to be making changes. And do you think companies should be tying ESG to executive KPIs and pay? And, and do you think this will help and make positive change? Uh, yes, I do. I do. I think uh, the more transparency we have around performance, and when I say performance, I mean not just financial performance, is, is critical. And that's what we need, right? You know, there's been a lot of conversations around how we need to move away from quarterly financial reporting because it overemphasizes this this, this need to look at, at short-term financial performance over long-term value. So I think anything that we do to bring in that kind of uh, framework where we actually value things beyond profit and bot bottom line is critical. Uh, the last couple of years has been, has been exciting because we've seen things around the, the triple bottom line and, and how we can actually tie KPIs to non-financials. Um, so there's a lot of work being done. And I think as consumers, not just as investors, but as consumers, we have an opportunity to, to, to demand that as well. Uh, and I think, you know, when we look back through 2020, we saw companies who did well, right? And we did we saw companies who, who behaved well. And when I say did well, I don't necessarily mean financial performance. I mean, behaved well. And we can and we should 
we should recognize that and value that. Excellent, thank you. And actually also, just thinking about it, we probably get more women in companies as well then. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, specifically in the investing and financial space. What do you think the sustainable investing landscape, what do you think it would look like in, in 10 years time from now? Um, so I think I think obviously it's evolving at a rapid rapid pace. Uh, I've been in the industry for, for sustainable finance for 15 years, and I've seen just a phenomenal transformation of the industry. Um, I'm now it, it's fascinating. You know, it was hard 10 years ago, and any of the any of the listeners who were involved in sustainable finance 10 years ago, it was a hard slog. You know, it was trying to convince people that this mattered. But now here we are. Um, everybody wants to talk about it and I, actually I joke with some of my colleagues about how now everybody's a sustainable finance expert um, which worries me but um, but in a way it's a good thing right it's a good thing that people care so I'm very optimistic when I look ahead for the next 10 years uh, we're seeing more and more sustainable investment products being launched they're more accessible to investors and uh, there's a lot more research out there we also now have pretty concrete evidence that all these old school myths around sustainable investing meaning reduced financial uh, performance we now have the evidence and the research which says actually no that's not the case so all of this is really building momentum uh, the also with mainstream media focusing its attention on things like climate modern slavery so as we become more conversant with these topics and build it into sustainable investing it's highly likely con to continue uh, one of the big issues i think is uh, governments and regulators we need them to really step up and do what they say they're going to do to support the finance and investment industry whether that's supporting more financial education whether it's ensuring greater transparency um, this relates back to my point about greenwashing uh, you know that's where the governments and regulators play a role to ensure that say if you're an asset manager and you put out a product that says sustainable fashion fund it genuinely is doing what it says it's doing right so i think i think that's that's important um on the positives i think the fact that we've got you know the young arising uh i talk a lot about women being highly motivated which is phenomenal but one of the other things is the you know young people today really care right and so they are looking at sustainability and the way they consume, the jobs they want to have, the way they want to spend their money. So that sort of being built into their value frameworks is, is really, really exciting. Um, and then the final thing to say is uh, technology is, is essentially democratizing the way we can invest. So we now have a lot of investment apps which make it much more accessible for us to, to, to really be able to, to invest. It's not like you have to have a million in the bank, right? You can now get on an app. Um, and increasingly we're seeing sustainable investment apps. I know there's been challenges with some of them because they just haven't got the customer flow. But I think technology is a really um, important platform to ensuring that we engage with more and more women and sustainable investors. So I'm, I'm excited by that as well. Um, and of course, the other thing about technology is it's providing much more real-time data so when we talked about how to look at KPIs and data, now with these sort of masterminds, techie masterminds sitting behind the scene, creating these um, systems which are putting out much more accurate real-time ESG data. So, so the whole field is, is radically transforming. Um, yeah, maybe I should start cashing in on that. <laughs> <laughs> um, we've got a lot of women on the call. Um, so I was actually going to ask, my next question was on sustainability and fashion. And we do have a question that's come through. Um, as a sustainable fashion startup, female-led, what's the best place to connect with principled investors who align with our brand's values and want to get involved? Yeah, I, you know, I, I, wrote, a, I wrote a guide on investing in sustainable fashion about about two years ago and honestly it's one of the most popular things on the moxie website you know when you can track who's reading what um and it's really interesting that so many and so in my book i actually include 
a section on investing in sustainable fashion. Um, and again, it sort of relates back to the consumer trends, whereas a lot of us are now wanting to buy bespoke pieces that are minimized environment. We, we're not into the fast fashion thing anymore, right? So for sustainable fashion startups, this is actually a great time to be launching. Now, it obviously involves quite a lot of capital up front. Um, I think the best thing is, again, going, going to those like angel investment networks, if there are any female focused ones as well. I mentioned Dubai because we, we, have, we have one here and I know in, in quite a few other markets there are those sort of female angel investment networks. Because one thing I found as well through my angel investing is that women quite often look for um, companies that are founded by female founders but are often solving social or environmental issues. I think we instinctively look for companies that are really thinking through global problems. So the angel stuff that I've been involved in, we, we often look at like education platforms in the health industry, you know, things that are really thinking about grappling with with different social social challenges. So I think that's a pretty good port of call. Um, if you're at the angel stage, as you go more to sort of the VC stage, we, we're seeing quite a few female focused VC funds come up. Uh, I think again in Asia there are a few. I know I know there are obviously in North America, um, so they're a good one. And uh, if you can get in with the right the right one, you can get a lot of support on the entrepreneurial side. So actually supporting the female founders as well. Excellent, thank you. We have another question here. How has the financial sector, and specifically men in the financial sector? responded um, to this book and your overall advice and how is St James's place supporting female sustainable investors um, so maybe you take the first part I'll take the second part <laughs> that's, your, that's your question so so the book only came out a couple of weeks ago but um, obviously during the course of writing yeah I've been in the finance industry for most of my career and um, I often cite some of the examples of the behavior as a, as a young professional in the finance industry where I was one of like zero other women, you know, like, I mean, I recite these stories to my teenage daughters and they're like, seriously, you know, the sexism that happened, you know, I lived and worked in London and then New York, it was just unbelievable. Um, so I, I've been quite accustomed to that, the industry as a whole. And, um, I see still a lot of it today. I really do. And it, it worries me. It worries me. And um, as much as we're all sort of nodding to diversity, the very fact that the finance and investment industry is so ingrained in that, that sort of mentality around um, short term gain and, and sort of ego and profile, um, it, it does it does concern me. Hence why I think this book is important and also why we need more women in the industry. So there's some great organizations and I, I do cover quite a bit in my book about how can we bring more women into investment management, into leadership roles in the industry itself, because the more we have that, the better. Also highly relevant to financial advisors. I, and Batu, you'll know the stats on this, but I think like the number of female financial advisors versus male is is really quite small. So the more we can get women in to be financial advisors to support female clients, the better. So I'm going to pass over to you now. <laughs> okay, thank you. And, and and one of the reasons why I joined St James's Place Wealth Management, I was actually a client um, before I joined, and I heard that they had no female expat partners that they were sitting in an office with 60 something men and there were no female partners. And I joined because I wanted to, I wanted to make a difference. So going back to the question about what is St. James's Place doing about sustainable and responsible investing and how we work with women. Well, St. Um, St. James's Place, um, we have signed up to the United Nations Principles of Responsible Investing and 100% of our fund managers our signatories. Okay, we have now developed a framework um, on sustainable and responsible investing, and we embed this in everything that we do. We have a new head of investment committee. His name is Robert Gardner, um, and he's based in the UK. A very, very big advocate 
for sustainable and responsible investing and we're seeing more and more coming out in that space. What we do is for women, um, well, each partner has their own philosophy. Um, I myself specialize in financial empowerment for women. I do work with men. I'm all about inclusion. I'm all about diversity. Um, but I do specialize in forming relationships with women, uh, promise not to use any jargon, and very value-based financial advice. Um, but there is a lot more happening in that space. Yeah, I think actually that point about inclusion and and in the industry, um, I think is really, really important. And I, I the number of male colleagues or friends that said, oh, I can't, it's like financial feminism. I say, yeah, but everybody can be a feminist. Not It's not an only women thing. So, I, I, yeah, you know, I think it's just keeping having those conversations around um, sort of a, a collective attitude, but at the same time, acknowledging there are certain in inbuilt biases that we do need to call out. You know, when I talked about the way we market to women versus the way we market to men, we need to call that out, right? And we need to change it. No, exactly. Women and men do have different values. They do mm. have different things that they want to invest in and, and speaking the languages um, and, and forming the relationship with the right kind of people. Anything that you invest in should be aligned to your values your goals and and that's why you should have those personal discussions about what's important to you yeah absolutely okay so we have another question we've got quite a few questions coming through um next question um for a company that i was interested in had a labor issue and unfair treatment and i did not invest later the company responded with a remedial action but i'm not sure of the impact of fair treatment in this scenario, how would you approach and ensure the company is fair to their labourers? Um, well, the first thing I'm, that's incredibly <laughs> impressive that you're actually you, you've identified an issue and you, you've tracked it and you've made decisions on that basis. Um, I think we have to now use the tools that we have. The first is your investment decision not to invest. The second is your ability now to communicate with the company um, and to use social media to express and, and talk about those issues. And again, you know, I, I mentioned about NGOs and the like, again, supporting those ones that are really doing the job that many of us want them to do, which is ensuring a level of accountability to these companies. Um, you know, I sometimes reference BankTrack, for example. Uh, BankTrack do an amazing job at monitoring the, the claims and the investments of many of the banking institutions around the world. And, and I think for us, as sort of the ecosystem in the sustainable investing world, we should support these, we should put, support these NGOs in doing this work because they're actually really part of the whole like accountability and, uh, ability and transparency. And that's really relevant to things like labor rights, um, child labor, supply chains and so on. So I think that's an important thing to do. But go to social media as well. We've got to use our voices there, right? Excellent, thank you. Uh, we have time for the last question. Do you have any advice for female university students looking to move into sustainable and responsible investment? Well, this is one of my favorite. Do you know, um, you can always reach out to me. I, I, I make it, I, I get a lot of requests on LinkedIn and I always, always follow up because there's nothing worse than somebody, you know, if a university student reaches out to, to you and you ignore them. So you can always reach out to me. Um, there's some great websites. So I like responsibleinvestor.com. Uh, they actually run a whole series of interviews with professionals to say, what was your background? How did you get there? Blah, 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 blah. Go and look at that. In fact, I did an interview with them. So if you connect with me on LinkedIn, I can send you the interview. But I know they've done a whole profile. Um, I think they've got a job website now as well. So that's responsibleinvestor.com. Um, reach out to investment professionals. As I said, I always say hello and follow up. And I'm sure many, many others do. Try and get some hands-on experience as soon as you can. Uh, this field is booming. If that means you go in working as a graduate trainee, but you know they're doing stuff on sustainable investing and you figure out how to get in there, then do it. Earn, earn your experience. We've all, we've all been there. Um, and don't give up. 
I really think this is the future of finance. And it's funny, I actually had a call with a, with a university graduate. He's a US university graduate um, a couple of weeks ago. And he said to me, he started talking because I've had this advice from this, from this person that it's just a waste of time, blah, blah, blah. And I said, what, is he a man and is he a trader? And he said, yes. I said, well, you're talking to the wrong person, right? That's what, <laughs> go and find the right people to talk to in the industry. Speaking to a male trader who's on the trading floor is not going to be understanding of sustainable investing. <laughs> so persevere. Excellent. Thank you. So we almost out of time. So final parting wise words of advice. Go. <laughs> um, okay. Really simple. I believe in the sisterhood in all shapes and fashion. And, and I believe in our personal lives, our careers, but in our investment. So find your sisterhood on this and work with them. The power of the collective. <laughs> love it, love it. Thank you so much, Jessica. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you everyone for dialing in. Um, I will send an email to everyone who's dialed in with the link uh, to Jessica's website. Plus, there will be details of where you can buy the book. Jess, where can we buy the book? So on my on the website, there's a book page and it lists all the different retailers. Um, obviously, you can get it on Amazon. I'm still getting my head around how Amazon works. Apparently, it's not very good for authors, but um, there's a whole bunch of different retailers you can get it from. Um, I'm try I really want to do an audio book. So if anybody knows any audio publishers, let me know. <laughs> You don't see about it. Not only you can imagine, I could actually be reading the book to you. <laughs> um, I, I bought this on Book Depository, um, and it yeah. took about a uh, took about a week to reach Singapore. Um, yeah, and I so, think Book Depository they're supposed to be good. Are they the ones who are sort of trying to be anti Amazon and look after yeah. authors? Yeah. Yeah, and they, they do free shipping. And actually, if anybody actually buys the book and reads it, please write a review because that really helps with getting it in front of more women. And the more women we get to read it, the easier our work is going to be. Trust me, I'm not making loads of money at all. <laughs> <laughs> OK, so everyone, I will email you um, the link to Market the Future. Get hold of this book. I promise you it's an amazing, easy read. Um, thank you all for dialing in and, and have a wonderful, safe evening ahead. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you, Jessica. Thank you. Take care, everyone. Bye. Bye. So it took you about a week, did it, then, to get it on book repository? Um, um, yeah, it took a week to get me. So I just, you know what I don't understand? I do not understand how Amazon works. I just, I, I need to get my head around the whole publishing industry. It just, because you know, I've gone with a UK publisher and I'm ex, oh, are you still, are we still watching? Yeah, people are still watching. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you what, I'll end it when I'll call you. <laughs> <laughs> Well, we an open conversation. There's nothing that we we are mad. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. <laughs> I don't know how to end this. Um, I'll figure it out. There we go. Thanks, everyone. We're ending now. <laughs> <laughs>